Hi, I'm Michela Menconi, an architect and lecturer at the University of Brighton in the south coast of England, where I teach architectural technology and design and sustainable construction. This small pilot study was produced as the outcome of my postgraduate certificate in academic practice. And as the title says, the study is an investigation into the experience of our students with feedback in design studio modules. In the last decade, the literature has particularly focused on students' engagement with feedback. In fact, a body of research in higher education agrees on the value associated with high quality feedback, which is considered amongst the main determinants of students' achievement. The approach to feedback has changed over the years from a transmission one, where students were passive recipients of feedback, to a dialogic approach, where students today should play an active role in seeking information, discussing it, and making use of it. Feedback has certainly a crucial role, but generally results as the weak side in national student service. And it is also clearly an area for improvement in the discipline of architectural education, which is also true at the University of Brighton, that is the geographical setting for this study. So it is unquestionable that today we face this paradox with feedback. On one side, students certainly value feedback and often lament the lack of quality feedback received. But on the other side, only a few students engage with it. And this causes frustration for staff and low performance for students. So recently, the emphasis has been placed on building students' feedback literacy as a way to increase students' engagement and satisfaction with feedback. Feedback literacy is defined by Carles and Bold as the understandings, capacities and dispositions needed to make sense of information and use it to enhance work and learning strategies. This ability is not only useful for student success at university, but can also be considered a fundamental life skill, much needed in their future profession and for their growth as constructive members of a society. So Carles and Bo described four main features of student feedback literacy, and these are appreciating feedback, so recognizing feedback taking place, making sense of feedback, so understanding it, managing the effect of feedback, so acknowledging its emotional impact, and acting upon it, so using it to improve one's work. The body of literature shows that tutors and lecturers can play a very important role in supporting student feedback literacy by means of effective curriculum design that could include some of these strategies. Teaching and learning activities that facilitate proactive students' engagement, learning outcomes clearly said and explained that form the basis for the standards used to provide feedback, building mutual trust between students and tutors, using a language which is accessible and provides clear information, giving feedback that facilitates student self-reflection, but also gives some directive information on how to improve their work, and setting assessment tasks that are sequenced and scaffolded, so build on each other, so that students can apply what they've learned from feedback. In architectural disciplines, the design studio experience is central and could be considered a special variant of problem-based learning where, contrary to other disciplines, there are many suitable answers to the given problem. And this depends on each student's design process and choices. For this reason, in the design disciplines, the role of feedback is particularly delicate and takes place not just at the end of the design process, but all through it, in many forms, such as regular one-to-one -one and group tutorials, but also peer reviews and interim and final crits. So a wide range of feedback experiences combined with increased use of online feedback strategies, which has been triggered by the COVID pandemic, offers a variety of feedback that if properly addressed, may facilitate students' engagement with it in design disciplines. So here is a slideshow of the many forms of feedback in design studio modules. Group tutorials is one of them, where the tutor meets with the students in group to discuss their work. Another form of feedback in design studio modules are one-to-one -one tutorials, which take place regularly during the whole design process. Then we have peer reviews where students gather in pairs or larger groups to give feedback to each other. 
and finally interim and often dreaded final crits that take place in front of peers, tutors and experts. This can be the most emotional and challenging form of feedback to engage with. And some literature, in fact, supports the use of additional private feedback sessions after the crits to mitigate their emotional impact and encourage students' reflection and action upon feedback. For the same purpose, more than one author suggested the use of digital technologies that can enable students to engage with feedback more freely, with less emotional stress and effectively taking in all the comments received and could potentially facilitate the tutor in moderating notes when there is more than one expert and tutor involved, ensuring consistency. In architectural disciplines, students are also exposed to a more subtle type of feedback, defined intrinsic feedback by Crowther in the context of architectural technology. This takes place when students engage with physical experiments or modeling or reproducing building elements. This way they learn by doing, being involved in a form of experiential learning where the activity itself can provide feedback. Given this scenario, the aim of my study was to investigate the feedback literacy of 80 students at the University of Brighton to propose recommendations for overcoming the barriers to students' uptake of feedback in studio-based modules. Here is the list of the objectives that had to be fulfilled to achieve the same. The research utilized the case study approach investigating student feedback literacy among 80 undergraduates at the University of Brighton. They were used as witness population and the data from them were compared to those obtained from a small sample of architecture students at the same university. Given the specificity of case study, I had to question what type of generalization was possible for my findings. Can they really contribute to the wider body of knowledge on this topic? So I've looked again at the literature and I came up with these justifications for my approach. Concerning the practicability of generalization from case study research, Sang suggested that cases should not be considered as sampling units and should be treated instead as experiments. Case study research can then be generalized to what he called theoretical propositions. Case study research design is a type of intensive study, while survey design is an extensive approach to research. So while survey research calculates frequencies to provide a statistical generalization, the purpose of case study research is to expand and generalize theories so the outcome can be defined analytical generalization. And interestingly, such generalization is not strictly linked to the number of cases investigated it could potentially be also achieved by means of one individual case study in this research, the AT course of the University of Brighton. Due to in-depth level of observation possible with case study research, analytical generalization has, according to the literature, the same, if not higher value than statistical generalization. So I was okay to go. Data from the chosen population of students were collected by means of a questionnaire. It was designed to investigate the four main features of feedback literature as described by Carles and Bode, and is structured therefore in four sections. It is made of five points, like at scale questions and open-ended questions to facilitate a mixed method analysis of findings. Of course, before contacting participants, the study was reviewed and given a favorable opinion by the University Ethics Committee. Participants were then selected using a convenient sampling technique. With the help of the course leaders, invitation emails were sent to AT and architecture undergraduate students. The invitation provided an information sheet which described aim and methods of the study and the link to the online questionnaire and consent form. 12 AT students out of 29 participated in this study, which is 41% of the total of the course. These are well distributed among level 4, 5 and 6 and could be considered a representative sample of the total AT population at the University of Brighton. Only five architecture students out of 230 of them did the survey, four level six students and one level five. This cannot be considered a statistically representative sample. However, most architecture students' responses are from level six students, so they can portray a more comprehensive view of the feedback experience in the architecture course. Therefore, they were considered useful to provide a snapshot of the population to which this study aims to compare its findings. Due to the limited sample size, a mixed method approach was not applicable and statistical methods were excluded. 
it was decided instead to apply a prevalently qualitative approach for the analysis of results, using thematic analysis to extrapolate themes from the written answers. This was aimed at assessing student feedback literacy and at comparing findings between the AT and the architecture cohorts of students. To highlight recurrent hurdles that limit students' engagement with feedback, and finally to help devising suitable solutions. Given the different representation of students in the survey, the analysis focused on 80 students at the University of Brighton as main witness population, and then the triangulation with the data obtained from the architecture students at the same university was useful to highlight possible strengths and weaknesses in the two cohorts and propose recommendations. The study utilized Carles and Baud four main features of feedback literacy as a theoretical framework for analysis. So the first part of it looked into the student's capacity to recognize feedback taking place, what is called appreciating feedback. Looking at the AT results on the left, it has to be noted that the low percentages related to crits in the AT course are likely due to the characteristics of the sample investigated, with five of the respondents being level four students, which do not have crits in their first year, and only two of them being level six students, which are the most exposed to peer feedback in the AT course. However, overall, AT students mainly recognize feedback when this takes place one-to-one -one with tutors, mostly in person and less online. Less of them acknowledged having engaged with group feedback, only a few of them when this was provided online, or with peer feedback. However, we know that these variants of feedbacks are offered throughout the course. So this possibly confirms what Baud and Molloy suggested, that students perceive that they receive feedback much less frequently than academics perceive that they give it. Looking at the architecture students' results on the right, it is evident that they engaged much more than ATs in feedback, and especially in online, one-to-one -one in group feedback and in peer feedback. Again, the characteristics of the sample investigated can certainly play a role in such differences in results. However, the written results of the questionnaire also showed that architectural students feel better prepared than IT students to work collaboratively. The second feature of student feedback literacy, according to Carles and Baud, is making sense of feedback, so understanding it. Most respondents can make sense of feedback, 92% of the AT students understand assessment tasks and criteria and how they relate to the learning outcomes. Only 60% of the architecture students do, and this might be due to the larger cohorts, a smaller tutor-student ratio, which may limit one-to-one -one contact with tutors or the chances to be spoon-fed. The majority thinks that feedback on the project helped them to identify good standards of work, was fair and insightful, and was detailed enough. Less respondents, 58% of the total, think the feedback on their work was timely. When expanding on the reasons for this, this was attributed to lack of structure for the studio sessions and to low staff students ratio. However, interestingly, this comment came from 80 students, which have one of the highest staff students ratio in our courses. The third feature of student feedback literacy is managing the effect of feedback. Most respondents can manage the emotional impact of feedback. Most of the total respondents feel that it was easy to receive emotionally, improved their self-efficacy and motivation and their ability to receive it. However, feedback is felt as discouraging when it is not directive, so does not clarify how to improve or when it does not acknowledge time and effort for producing their work. So timeliness results a critical aspect of feedback and the main determinant of students' capacity to deal with the emotional effect of it. This was highlighted by both cohorts. Late feedback can be demotivating and frustrating, as one could feel unsupported and may have to make changes when it is too late in the design process. Interestingly, only one AT respondent took responsibility for engaging with feedback too late, pointing out another important aspect of feedback. It can be a daunting experience for those that struggle with social interaction, this may be one reason for low engagement and satisfaction with peer and group feedback among ATs. The fourth feature is acting upon feedback, using it to improve one's work. Most of the respondents can and will act after feedback to improve their current and future work at university and in their profession. 
Most respondents felt that feedback improved their ability to self-assess their work and to review the work of others. However, peer feedback is the least liked among ATE students and even seen as an unnecessary distraction in the written answers. This can be a reason why only half of the ATE students versus 80% architectural students feel better prepared to work collaboratively and in a team after engaging with feedback. So the key findings from the analysis of the written answers show that feedback as it is perceived by the students is in line with the way the literature describes it. Feedback is seen as a process in which they engage with info that is relevant for their work and it is meant to point out positive aspects of the students' work as well as areas for improvement. However, the main problem with feedback is in its timeliness, confirming that feedback is valuable only when it can be actively used. Also, only two AT students mentioned feedback as prompted by them, showing a more active role in engaging with it. So the prevalent approach to it is still quite passive in our cohort. This could be linked to these two key findings. Most AT students prefer a directive type of feedback, confirming the idea that students' growth, their ability to self-assess the quality of their work, does not always come for student satisfaction. And this, in turn, can be a reason as to why AT students mainly recognize feedback when this takes place one-to-one -one and show lower engagement and satisfaction with group and peer feedback. The figure shows a synthesis of the findings from this study, highlighting pros and cons of different types of feedback as given by the literature, the main hurdles in engaging with feedback and the reasons behind such hurdles from the analysis of findings, and finally proposing solutions as devised from the discussion of findings. Certainly, most AT students in our courses prefer the directive type of feedback, where students take a more passive role. Peer feedback, however, is considered extremely productive for student-based modules, for both the reviewer and the reviewee, and contributes to create a more student-centered environment. Also, even if the majority stated that feedback was easy to receive emotionally, the literature suggests that the emotional impact of feedback should not be underestimated and could have an impact on intrinsic motivation, especially for first-year undergraduate students. The findings of this study show a connection between the timeliness of feedback and how easy it is to deal with its emotional effect. So, the comparison between the two cohorts showed that a more structured use of peer and group feedback in person and online could facilitate timely feedback, reduce the emotional effect of it, and enable a more active role of AD students in their own learning, developing critical thinking and collaboration skills, and ultimately improving students' achievement and satisfaction, and also easing the pressure from staff. So looking forward, how do we facilitate a more structured use of peer and group feedback in studio-based modules? Here are some suggestions from the analysis of our findings and the literature. The studio sessions could be restructured to make peer feedback a key part of learning and teaching. As part of this, smaller peer groups could be used and the wider and more structured use of online feedback would facilitate communication and inclusivity. Also, the use of intrinsic feedback could be increased in the form of good examples of work to be exposed in the studio to facilitate engagement with peer discussion. Finally, because many students do not have any feedback literacy when they start, particular attention should be placed to involve and prepare first-year students to all type of feedback at university. So four features of student feedback literacy, as discussed by Carl and Baud, were investigated among 80 students and compared to a small sample of architecture students at the University of Brighton in this study. The findings of this study helped to evaluate the quality of students' experience of feedback in the AD Studio modules at the University of Brighton and might help revising the structure of these modules to facilitate students' engagement with feedback and enhance their learning. This study could be used as a pilot study and could be replicated over several years. The analysis of results could be used to investigate changes in student feedback literacy over a period and to assess and revise the feedback and assessment diet within the courses. With larger sample sizes, then a mixed methods approach could be taken for the data analysis, utilizing both quantitative and qualitative analysis. Thank you for listening. Please email me any question.